Alex, I need my coffee to get my spirits up for this spirited group. <laughs> Wonderful to see you this morning. Everybody going home? I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge the socks off of you. You know, the purpose of the Center for the Study of the Presidency in Congress is to look at the great moments of history of success and failure. This, is he milking that? I'm not a milk person. Isn't he? <laughs> they don't want to water down with milk. Um, but we believe in great presidential leadership beginning with Washington and Lincoln. It demands courage. It demands ideals. It demands strategic leadership, and by that we mean ways and means, uh, timing to get there. You've got to have character. Uh, my friend Jimmy Carter, and I've done things with him, had abundance of character, but lacked strategic leadership other than when he was at Camp David. Nixon, who found troops in Vietnam and he, with Kissinger, tried to open things up by cross-sectioning with China and Russia, had brilliant uh, strategic leadership. He failed because he had no character. He lied to the country. You've got to have both. Washington had both. Lincoln had both. Roosevelt uh, cut down as a, as a young man with polio, learned that from it and how to identify with other people that were cut down took us through Great Depression and Great War. Uh, dying his last year in office and we didn't know it. That kind of heroic leadership is needed again. Lincoln said a house divided cannot stand. Our house is divided in Washington. Now I met with a group from China yesterday. I don't want conflict with China. But there's got to be a balance of power in the Middle East. And there's got to be a balance of power in Asia. And it's not a matter of American imperialism. We're the only balancer. And today, not just our head of the Federal Reserve or this commission that we've talked about, that you heard about looking at the physical future, but Secretary Clinton and Secretary Gates talk about they're weighted down by our deficits and debt. And when we try to negotiate and bring pressure on China to bring pressure on North Korea with nuclear weapons or on Ahmadinejad, they say, well, we're going to help you, but they don't help us too much. And we got no leverage. Now, all of that can be restored. Now, these things that I've named uh, seem maybe beyond you where you, you are now. I was shocked when we had the people from the, on the fiscal, and you asked, will you have Social Security? There was not one hand that went up. What we're concerned about, above all, is your generation, that you not be the first generation in this century where my generation is passing on to you a less future than was passed on to us. What are we going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? So I got a proposition. And we'll develop some a leadership group and an organization group out of you because I want to develop a declaration that you all write to the President and to the Congress, and I'm also going to my trustees. I've got some trustees with a lot of money. I don't have enough of that lot of money. That's just their lack of judgment. But they got a lot of money. <laughs> Even billionaires. I don't have a billion. I don't have anything like that. I should from them. <laughs> and, uh, but 
they're on the Republican and Democratic side. One of them has been the lead fundraiser for a wonderful person, come back as ambassador to the Vatican, for, for, for Boehner and these Republicans. Other on the Democratic side, Eli Broad, one of the great men of America, who's give, worth four and a half billion, giving away four and a half billion. Leading in educational reform. So we've, we've got connections with influence to say to these people in Congress, and I'm going to them for a resolution, now let's get together. I had a, um, a meeting several years ago with Mitch McConnell. I'm on camera, but I'm sort of off the record. Famous statement. He called me up there and said, we're talking about civility this morning. David, I have read this declaration that you and Ambassador Max Campbellman put together 200 Americans calling for civility and inclusive leadership. Written up in the Washington Post. But he said, you've also worked on the practical level. How does that work on the practical level? And I said, well, I'd have an off-the-record session. He thought he was going to be majority leader. He ended up minority leader, but he thought he was going to be majority leader. He said, to my right is a picture, is a picture of John Sherman Cooper, Senator Cooper. When you were Assistant Secretary of State, 1970-71, you did the amendment to the amendments of the Cooper Church Amendment so that our troops would at least be protected, fired upon from Cambodia. I was an intern there. I didn't particularly like him saying that. I felt older. But I was an intern, a fly on a wall, when you were in the back room with him and when you went over to church. And back of me is Henry Clay from my state of Kentucky, the great compromise. He didn't prevent the Civil War, but he put it off from 1820 to 1850. That's what I'd like to be. So I said, that's very inspiring. I said, you should get your counterpart, who will be Senator Daschle, have an off-the-record meeting of the Senate before these issues coalesce into legislation, talk them through with no publicity. I've been running CSIS before that. We, we had such groups that we organized, particularly in the 70s. Talk it through and find a way ahead, because the country's in trouble. Great idea. They did it. It was never in the papers. What happened? Well, I hate to tell you this, because George W. Bush decided on a surge. By the way, in our Iraq study group, we had proposed a surge, but we had proposed lesser surge, because there was one, only one and a half brigades that were ready, combat ready. It took them five months to get the five brigades. But they said they were in such a rush, they didn't have time to discuss it with Congress in advance. And then, I'm sorry to say, that a person that I had known because he read our presidential studies quarterly, Carl Rove decided that he would use this also as a wedge political issue. And don't quote me back at SMU, my friend here. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> and we, the country then was split. There should have been a surge. But I'm saying there were high hopes. I'm going back to Mitch McConnell the Mitch McConnell who said two, three days ago, our objective is to defeat the president. If you look at Good Morning Joe, the best program on, Joe, former conservative Republican Congress, said, don't take that serious. That was like a football game, Army Navy. You know, beat the, beat the other team. Because earlier Mitch McConnell says, I can work with the president. My person close to Boehner says that. You've got people on the flanks that won't want that. So this declaration is telling them where your generation stands 
and you're concerned about the future of the country, and I'm going to get my trustees to do the same. Now, while you're gone, I will send you an inscribed copy of my book, A Call to Greatness, Challenging the Next President. We sent this to all presidents in advance, all candidates in advance, saying we were in trouble. The commission that we formed of David Walker, originally David Walker, Norm Augustine, because he had done the great National Academy study, Rising Above the Gathering Storm and a Pan Pan Panetta, Leon Panetta, who was the person that came into Clinton's cabinet when they moved to triangulation, which is what we've got to move to again after Gingrich had overfired and the closing down of government. So, they have a call to greatness, but you have a call to greatness. Now, let me turn to civility. I had written a piece, which we'll also send you. It's not as, as, as good as Susan Herp's, this magnificent book, but for the Fetzer Institute on the Grace and Power of Civility. I go back into the American experience. I emphasized in that book and that book, and by the way, it was the publisher that thought of the name grace and power of civility. Power of civility. People on extreme right, extreme left, say we're not going to compromise that watering down, none of that centrism and all that stuff. Those people don't know the Founding Fathers in Philadelphia that wrangled for over three and a half months and old Ben Franklin, 81, I used to think that's old, he was just getting started. Old Ben Franklin took his spectacles off and he said, let's each one doubt a little bit of his own infallibility and sign on to this document. They had far more wedge issues than, than we've got today. Far more. They did the impossible. They came together and they didn't think, if you'll pardon the expression, it was very damn good. In retrospect, it was the miracle of Philadelphia. It was a miracle that made this Republican, this country possible. When Barack Obama, and I know the man, Newt Minow at Sidley and Austin that hired both the Obamas, told me to take a close look. He comes from the left. I think he wants to govern, govern from the center, like Lincoln. Lincoln came from the left. You know, he had to move the center to hold the North together. So, in the inaugural, we had thought that he would go back to Lincoln, the great liberator. He went back to the founding father. He went back to the founders and the two founding documents, one of which had his wife's forebears characterized as three-fifths of a person. But he knew that our process had legs if you followed the process. And it could produce what we've got. So we've got to go back to the example of the founders, and we've got to stretch up. Susan is at a great institution, one that I visited. One of the greatest Americans that I know, who's been my partner in many endeavors, and who I got to chair the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and that I worked with when he first came in as a senator when I was Assistant Secretary of State, is Senator Sam Nunn. He's an extraordinary American. I only wish he had been President of the United States.